I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for today's panel. He will then, along with our distinguished guests, take it from there. So he'll introduce you to folks and get things underway. This is, I think, the first time that Orchestras Canada, you, you know that we are somewhat technologically challenged, but with the help of Emily from St. Jack's Church and the enthusiastic collaboration of Christos Hatzis, who's in Krakow, Poland today, uh, we are bringing you not only a live panel, but also a panel involving Christos, who is uh, in, in Europe now, uh, attending performances of his works and uh, um, traveling. So it's pretty great that we've managed to, uh, to get this to work, and I'm grateful to everyone for their collaboration and cooperation. So I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for today's panel. Uh, his name is Clayton Windat, and I first met Clayton through uh, our joint work with the Canadian Arts Coalition, putting together Arts Days on Parliament Hill. Uh, Clayton, I think, first came to an Arts Day probably five or six years ago, and I was immediately seized with um, love. I love Clayton Windat. Um, he is smart, he is funny, he tells it like he sees it, um, he is a completely engaging individual, um, his willingness to speak truth to power, um, but also value relationships, um, he is an extraordinary builder of relationships, um, and he can give it to you like nobody's business when, when, it's, when it's required. He's someone I really value in my life. Now, um, in his uh, day job, uh, Clayton is the director of the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective. Prior to that, uh, he was working as the director of the Whitewater Gallery, an artist-run center uh, in North Bay for seven years. But much more than this, Clayton is someone who absolutely embodies um, the spirit of the artist and the spirit of the advocate. Um, he is an active performance artist, he is a visual artist, he is a curator, and he's someone who I trust absolutely to say what needs to get said. Can I stop talking now, Clayton? Okay. Uh, there we go. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. <laughs> Is it? Oh, there we go. It's got that thing where it, it, if I don't talk, it goes quiet. So I'll try to regulate my voice. I am a very passionate speaker, so this computer might have a hard time with me. There. Is that good? There. We'll keep it like like I'm uh, Peter Mansbridge. Um, thank you for that introduction, uh, Catherine. Um, it's it's a very very valuable to be here. Um, I'm I'm glad you opened up by talking uh, started by talking about our relationship and and it, it kind of that relationship sort of feeds into how maybe this panel has happened, um, which was proposed in many different incarnations and has ended with this very talented group of people. And uh, we worked on how to come up with the conversation of uh, deconstructing um, the, the, the ballet Going Home Star, but also how to deconstruct kind of current major institutional projects in a way that can be a benefit moving forward. Because in the end, we were very aware of the audience that's here and how uh, there might be indigenous focused initiatives in the future for some of these groups. So these groups maybe need a little bit of pointing in a certain direction or telling you what maybe other directions not to go in. So anyway, instead of me getting into it a whole bunch, because I'm like not even supposed to be talking, I'm supposed to be moderating. Um, I could start by uh, introducing this group of people that I'm with. And I think everybody can see Christos, which I don't even know what time it is where he is right now, but I'm sure it's super inconvenient. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to say thank you for setting a stage for Christos taking the time to go and do that and, and be wherever you are. And then uh, maybe before I actually get into, uh, I wasn't, I'm not doing a formal land acknowledgement, but I did want to acknowledge the territory we're in. Um, 
this came up this morning because uh, it it's, there, it's you know doing a formal land acknowledgement ceremony is a whole other thing. But to say that we're uh, you know I, I pulled this off McGill's website, it, it works out really well. So like McGill says this public statement of like a connection to the land is intrinsically linked to indigenous identity. Historically, the cultural protocol of acknowledging traditional territory symbolizes the importance of place and identity for indigenous peoples. And I'm like, yep, that's true. Um, specifically for this region, it's many groups, but focusing on the Algonquin people. And uh, that Montreal is sort of, uh, how do we pronounce that again? It's like, it's Gandganetka, is that right? Which one? Kanyikahaka. See that? It's pretty awesome. I would know that much better if I lived here and speak to Algonquin. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's funny because this morning when it came up, like the I did what everybody does with land acknowledgements is like pull out your phone and start Googling how to deal with it because it's I'm doing it in place of someone who does it uh, officially as ceremony. So I wanted to acknowledge their absence and say that this is my cheap version of that. <laughs> Ooh, tough crowd. Um, You're in the church. <laughs> yes. Uh, so maybe instead of me re reading through your bios, uh, I'll say, I'll, I'll start and I'll, we'll go through the, the line and we'll end with Christos because so Christos will call upon you to, to say something in just a sec but uh, uh, my name is Clayton Windat uh, I'm an artist a writer I work for the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective and I'm here to uh, talk about uh, the deconstruction of Going Home Star and do you want to follow suit and kind of talk you know shotgun level bio of yourself I know you can do it my name is Lee Miracle in my language, way of life means art. Hi, I'm Jeff Hurd. I was the executive director of the Winnipeg Ballet uh, and uh, co-producer with uh, and Going Home Star. Hello, uh, my name is Christine Friday. Uh, Christine Nadizhnikas, Lake Tamagami Donjaba. Uh, Ottawa Dinda. My name is Christine Friday. I'm from uh, a place called Friday's Point on Lake Tomogamy, which is north of North Bay. I live in Ottawa. I am an, an Indigenous contemporary dance artist, choreographer. I teach, do a lot of work with youth, and um, I'm here to share my perspective as an artist on Going Home Star. Um, hello, my name is Sarah Rock. I'm Nishnabe Metis from the community of Shebanon in Killarney, Ontario. My mom's Nishnabe, my father is European from Northern Europe. Um, I've, my um, background is um, I've spent 10 years at the Ontario Arts Council in the Indigenous Arts Office. Um, so I think I'm bringing that piece to the panel is my um, work within institutions. I've also worked with the National Film Board um, so I, I guess I'm bringing, and my background um, is also in activism. So I'm here to speak a little bit about organizational change and change within institutions. Maybe we get there. Mugek sepa kita tamskata na wagakio, Mr. Goski na pe sisnyan siga sun units kapu nego tse ne yonia. Good morning to all of you. I greet you all. My name is uh, Drum Boy, Mr. Gwaski Gnapesis. Uh, that is my real name. Uh, my Western European name is uh, Steve Wood. I'm from uh, Sad Lake, Alberta. I am Cree. Uh, I am also a uh, high school Cree teacher. Um, and I, I, uh, I lead a, a, a um, traditional musical group that I formed in 1982. Um, called Northern Cree uh, and I, I along with my group played a uh, small role in uh, uh, the uh, production of Going Home Star. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to my one good friend out there Christos. Uh, I hope you're, you're, you're rested. 
glad to be here. I hi, Mr. Hai. And Christos, do you want to uh, speak to the audience, give them a little background? Yes, uh, my name is Christos Hatzis. I'm a composer. I'm a first generation uh, immigrant from Greece by the way of the United States where I did most of my, all of my studies. And uh, I came to Toronto in uh, uh, 1982 and I have been in the area ever since. Thank, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> I love technology so much. Um, thank you so much. So as you can see, we have a, like a very large panel and we have about an hour that we're going to try to... An hour, longer? We're going to go as long as we want. Yeah. People don't have buses or trains to get on. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Lee's got something... Oh, you got something... Oh, you got something to say or you got somewhere to be? I got somewhere to be. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, I feel that one of the starting points might be to kind of... To, no. One of the, so, I feel like the starting point um, can be to acknowledge uh, where the project came from and where and, and that it happened and then to kind of acknowledge the climate we're in and then we can start talking about sort of next steps and where this is uh, where this all came from and then where we're going so um, maybe Jeff could talk a little bit about sort of some of the things this morning uh, to lead us into things and then people can interject politely as we go along well, thank you So I'll give you a bit of the uh, history of how we came about uh, to going home star. Uh, many years ago, the Royal Winnipeg Ballet did a ballet uh, based on the uh, uh, ecstasy of Rita Joe, and that had been commissioned by, at the time, the Manitoba Indian Brotherhood. Um, that ballet, I think, uh, was of a place and of a time. But there was an elder in the Winnipeg community and a ballet fan, Mary uh, Richards, who uh, had suggested to the artistic director that something else should be done uh, based on the community and the interrelationship. And that idea sat idle for quite a few years. Uh, many years later, the idea of the 75th anniversary for the Royal Winnipeg Ballet and instead of doing another Peter Pan or, or something like that, we wanted to do something relative to where we live and, and where we exist in uh, Canada. And a lot of ideas were tossed around. We had a wonderful board member, uh, Tina Keeper, and she was also involved on the production committee with the artistic team, and they started talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, so the, the ballet was started to be thought about about where we live and, and, and what we see and, and what we experience. Um, the, uh, the ballet then started uh, having a life and um, with guidance from elders in the community, uh, with uh, guidance from uh, uh, members of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we spent about two and a half, three years uh, doing uh, research and, and uh, looking into the uh, where we should go with this. It ended up being Going Home Star, which we opened in uh, 2015 in Winnipeg. And we took it on tour uh, to some places across Canada. So that's where the ballet came from, uh, in short. There was a very interesting conglomerate of people involved in it. And um, uh, I must say that for all of us, uh, thinking we knew a bit of our history and knew a bit of our uh, Canadian identity, shall we say. Uh, I think it had become very educational and I hope, I hope from if we listen and not just listen but if we hear some of the things that will be talked about on the panel, I hope we all continue to learn from, from this experience and from perceptions and realities and different points of view. And I think it's very important if we think about how we do projects in the future. I think it's, uh, it's a very important thing. So I'll leave it there for now and, and let it go from there. 
So that, that sets, sets a, a starting point. Everyone knows about the production. Um, now we can maybe, uh, there was, you know, the part of this entire panel is that the, some of the people that are sitting on this panel are the critical voices of the production itself. So the people who brought attention to the failings, let's say, of the, the project, whether it's content or it's structure or it's outcomes. Um, and maybe I could ask someone to, uh, like Lee, I can see you're, you're thinking a lot. <laughs> All the time, right? <laughs> Uh, or if someone else had something specifically to start us off about talking about the project and how it feeds into uh, rights or appropriation. <laughs> so this is, um, this is quite um, real and in intense for me to be here right now uh, with all of you. I have been carrying this for over a year and a half um, after seeing the production in Ottawa at the National Arts Centre. And I come from, I'm Anishinaabe, Kwe, which I didn't say before, but my mom is Cree and Algonquin. My father is Irish and Italian, but I'm very connected to uh, my mother's, to my community and to um, the land where I come from. Uh, my mother went to residential school uh, she went to Shingwalk, and uh, so did my uncle, and so did uh, my aunt. And I went to the Royal Winnipeg Ballet School as a young girl. I left home when I was 14 years old to live a dream, and so I did. Uh, I left the school uh, after three years because at that time, it was not what I was about. So I uh, very bravely as a young girl told them, thank you for everything you've given me, but this is not what I'm about. I, in my journey, I've, um, my work is about who I am, where I come from, and it's rooted in that experience. Um, so I went to see the show with my mom and, you know, for someone who struggles as an artist, um, and it was very intense for me to watch because I was shocked. I was shocked by what was put on stage. Um, and to me, it was a self-serving piece of art that had no reflection of our true experience and our true story. We seem to have skipped over that truth um, because it's uncomfortable. Um, yeah, they went straight to reconciliation. And even beyond reconciliation, we need action. So, but we'll get to that, because I'm hoping that's what will come out of this. To see what was portrayed on stage um, was feeding stereotypes. And what's dangerous about this is that this carried to a large audience that was more, that, to a prestigious audience. Um, and for me, I, I, I asked, what was the intention of this work? Like, why, why were they doing this? Um, and because to me, my, my work and my, my art is about transformation and that, that healing happens in that process. It's, um, I was sharing before that it, there is, I was born into my family as a contemporary dance artist to be able to express the truth of my family and my community and my nation, and that, um, and to tell our stories and to move through things. Like to me, art is not like, oh, I was never, I've never been in that place where I could just, oh, well, let's do this or let's do that. Like it's more, it lands on me and it's very real and, and I evolve through it. As a young girl, I would create pieces about what I was going through in my life. Uh, and then I would create a dance piece about it and I would perform it. So it was a way of how I learned about myself. As I got older, they became bigger visions with a bigger responsibility. And so to me, art is about evolution of, of life. There's no separation from it. And um, everything to me is about intention because being an artist is, um, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I love to do. I'm getting off track here, but, I was, so I was, 
there was just no truth in the performance. Like there was a lot, it was like, a, and it was disconnected. It was like, a, there was, it seemed like it was carefully put together, but, but for what reason? So I'm not asking, and it was like, you know, when my mom was a young girl, every night the nuns would tell her when she went to bed, you know, I, I'm sorry, we're sorry that you're an Indian, but it's okay now because we're here to save you and to help you. And when my mom went, spent 10 years there, when she came back home, there was a family disconnection. And I, I will share that. You can take away our language, you can take away our land, you can break our families down, but you will never kill our spirit. And that my spirit is alive. And after watching this piece, I told myself that I am so inspired to create the most incredible piece of work to show and share with people really who we are and what we're about as a people and, and not be afraid of the truth because things can get ugly but then we all have to come through it together and um so that's where i'll begin there's lots i don't want i hope this isn't my only moment yeah, but yeah, you don't you don't get to talk again <laughs> Kevin, i'm not letting go <laughs> so um so I, and also to dig deeper not to even in our um, in our communities, there's a, a lot of us, there's, it seem to be the same artists that get used in, um, in, in performance and collaborative work with the mainstream institutions, but there is a lot of us, like they could have, we could have casted a whole classical contemporary dance artist in this piece. If we took the time and, uh, to find those people because we're here like we we are alive um and so there's so much i i, I feel like i need to share because it's a very important moment because I, I at first when i saw the piece or when this was happening too i thought what am i going to do about this am i going to protest this uh am i going to dance outside in the snow and be like this is real you want to see real native dancers indigenous contemporary dancers but i thought that's ridiculous they're just going to think i'm <laughs> Uh, crazy uh, so I and I wanted to watch the piece and I did and um, so I I guess uh, and I, I do work in the schools I uh, I I'm a powwow dancer as well I, I present contemporary dance I tell the story of my family of who we are where we come from and then I end with a, a fancy shawl dance so to me I, I don't just dance to dance <laughs> there's there's meaning and there's there's purpose and to me it's ceremony. There's no difference, uh, and the, and and I, to me, my life is ceremony, even in this very moment. Lee, Lee. Hello. You Can you all hear me? Yeah. I want to get before going home, Star, because it's based on something. It's based on the invasion, the rape, and the pillage of indigenous women, and let's say our murder as well. We're just now getting a commission on the murdered indigenous women, and it's shrouded in secrecy. Nobody knows what's going on with that commission, but that's kind of typical too of Canadian invasion. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, the Canadians who participated in that project did not look at themselves in that context. So there's no story there. There's a bunch of pieces that to me are voyeuristic, but let's look at the commission too. There's no truth in the commission. In the commission, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, in order to get out of being sent to jail, the guilty had to face the people they hurt. That's not what happened here. A bunch of indigenous people got up and said what happened. The Europeans that did it were guaranteed no charges would be laid. No matter what came out of the TRC. So that's the first big lie. And they got 15,000 people to agree to that. 15,000 people who were desperate, desperate, 
desperate to be heard. And let me tell you, desperate people do not make good decisions. And we've been in a desperate circumstance for half a millennia. And no Canadian I know has sat down and thought to himself or herself, what happens when you're in a desperate circumstance, generation after generation after generation, what happens? Well, this is what happened. They consulted with a bunch of elders, they said. I believe them. My elders in the 70s were as colonized as I'm sure the elders are today. When you tell someone every day, this is the story that we say, if you keep calling someone an asshole, eventually they behave like one. If you keep making people desperate, eventually they become desperate. But the second thing is our sense of courtesy. My father was a courteous man, but I know he didn't like white folks very much. And I asked him in front of my daughter, because I love his answers, they're always funny. I said, Dad, how come you don't like white people? And he says, we're driving along. What do they call this? I said, rush hour. We're not rushing anywhere. It's crawl hour. How can you trust a man who can't tell the truth about the simplest thing? Now, my daddy would never say that to a white guy. He would always nod yes. And I'll tell you the experience that he had in the performing arts industry. My aunt did a draft of a play. I'm in that draft. And then they asked their good friend, George Riga, to help them workshop it. And then he took it and he patented it or copy wrote it or whatever you do to hijack the play. And then he changed the ending from young Jamie Paul fighting off the attackers so Rita could get away to the rape, gang rape and murder of Rita Jo. And my aunt argued with her dad, my grandfather, about not being in that play because they'd done what, Riga had done what he did. And my grandpa said, never mind, we know who wrote it. And caused a rift in my family that's only now being healed. And we realized that my grandfather wonderful as he was, amazing as he was. Those 10 years in residential school did something to him. I want you to understand that. My grandfather fought for us all our lives and yet he could not stand up to Riga and say, why did you steal my girl's play? So now Riga is known as the author of The Ecstasy of Rita Jo. That's the story of indigenous people in this country. Everything that was ours belongs to Canada. And I don't see Canadians saying, well, how does this affect me and how I look at me, how you look at me. That's the story you can tell because it's the one you can sit and figure out. It's the one you know intimately. I do not know how it is to colonize somebody. You do. That's the story I want to hear. You do not know how it is to be colonized. Not the author of that Going Home Star or the author that hijacked my aunt's play. We know those stories. Christine knows that dance. Shame on Canada. This, there it goes. That's uh, just gonna take a second there. Cause the mic doesn't work. 
I know, right? Like, what am I supposed to say after you say that, Lee? Um, okay. Because we, we, you know, I, we, we should have had you end with that, Lee. It's going to be hard to talk for the next hour. Can you? Yeah. Uh, so, Sarah Rock, do you mind picking up on something? Um, the brave one to follow Lee. But um, I think there's something very powerful um, in what Lee was, what you said this morning at breakfast and now, and that's the idea of looking at ourselves. Um, and that is... That is, um, that is um, when we move from, okay, looking at ourselves personally, but also at our institutions that we are in. Um, and that often comes, is met with a lot of resistance, that process of decolonization um, within ourselves and within our institutions. But I always, um, I compare it to um, knots in our body and within our institutions, we have those too. And we need to look at that dissonance and we need to address it. Or else at some point, it's gonna cripple you if you just ignore your, um, you know, the knots that are in your body. Um, and understanding where our institutions, it's often in our leadership, but it's not just the leadership, it's everyone within an institution that needs to look at themselves and at our institutions and where we're creating barriers and where we're perpetuating systemic racism and inequalities. Um, I just want to quickly say, at a personal note too, that I worked for 10 years at the OAC, David Parsons, great to see you. And um, we're sort of positioned as, I would say we um, have become a leader in our policy. Um, but that's no, there's so much more work to do with our um, work with um, decolonizing our institution. It took about seven years before we were, a, and a change of leadership where we now acknowledge the land, for example. Um, and so, I, you know, the, the resistance can be within your organization, within the communications team. It can be within the operations, every single, organ of your institution needs to go through this looking at ourselves. Um, and I'll just say also that I worked for 10 years. I always saw my position as a translator to uh, a leader, but mostly a translator because I knew that my, the community of indigenous artists that I was serving would, would um, demand a lot and would tell me when I'm out of line or there's often duels um, double accountability for Indigenous people when we're in institutions that were first and foremost accountable to our community. And um, so I considered myself quite a vocal activist within both the National Film Board when I made a film with them and also within the Arts Council. And then in um, November 2015, I was diagnosed with cancer and um, I suddenly was now, knowing my journey ahead, I was going to face the health institution. And I suddenly was terrified about disclosing my indigeneity. And I really recognized my privilege, and I want to acknowledge my privilege for my visual look that I was able to, that I am able to pass and not disclose that information. Um, and this this is really well researched within the health field that indigenous people before they go to an emergency room there is strategizing that happens before we engage with um, an institution that is going to have that we are powerless in but also the terror of possibly losing our lives because we're not because of these inequities these are really real and in my life they're very real I have two friends that are, you know, that are, um, you know, have had very, very real physical impact um, in their lives and disability because of mistreatment within the healthcare system. So, um, through that experience and now that I'm back and going um, back into my work at the Arts Council, I was really looking at models and how does this never, you know, how do we never allow anyone, indigenous person, to knock on our door and have that terror 
or how do we make it a friendly place and not just mediocre? How do we make it more open? And I really believe that the models are there in the healthcare system. And um, I'm just starting on work as in cultural safety and how we can employ it and, and I, um, put that into an art setting because I think it's critical and people might not be physically dying, but arts organizations can be or people can be really damaged internally with um, if we don't have uh, more meaningful, if, if we don't look at ourselves. Um, I, I guess I'll just stop from there. I think um, one point about cultural safety though, and then I'll stop, is that it moves away from this idea of cultural sensitivity. Um, so often when I started work at the OAC, it was like, can you do a workshop on cultural sensitivity? And I thought, well, I'm not trained to do that and it makes me really uncomfortable and that's not sustainable. And I. Um, I felt there was always an exoticism attributed to that. So people often want to learn about indigenous peoples if there's something they can take from it. So if there's some sort of perhaps spiritual gain or something that they can take for themselves. So I was very protective of that and had to work with a lot of elders to wrap my head around, you know, when do we smudge in the institution or how do I, what is my role in protecting things also? But, um, Cultural safety is an idea that we move from respect for other into this idea of cultural competency and not a checklist where we can navigate with the political and historical background and understanding and looking at ourselves that we can navigate as conflict arises. Um, I'm just gonna end it there, sorry. Hey, no, 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 it's, it's part of what we're, we're getting to is the, you, know, you have to get it all out if we're going to have this move forward, right? Um, so I guess, uh, God, I love this microphone. It is, it's interacting <laughs> with me. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'd like to, I'd like to say that we've, we're, we're kind of, um, we're acknowledging a lot of major systemic issues that reside within all aspects of Canada. And um, when, I, when we were talking earlier, uh, St St Steve brought up how um, there were education points that were trying to be achieved through the project. Uh, maybe, Steve, you could speak to that a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. I'm actually a, a better listener. Um, yeah, as I was uh, telling my my, uh, my fellow panelists this morning, I'm um, one of uh, the teachings that I learned uh, in Cree teachings is the first teaching of living a good life is Nanahi uh, Tamuin, which is pole number one on our lodge, which teaches all of our children about uh, good listening skills and obedience to your parents and to your teachers. So um, I like to listen first and, and uh, gather other people's thoughts. Um, you know, uh, when they first called about uh, having my group come out and be a part of this project, I was uh, wondering about it because as we we're flying, as I was flying for my first visit uh, with meeting with uh, people who I'd never met with or, or uh, a... Uh, um, a project uh, that I'd never, I'd never thought of, because I'd never, I'd never went to a ballet in my life. I'd only seen it on television, and it wasn't something that uh, I, I, I couldn't really understand it on television. And I was thinking as I was on that plane, I wonder what this project is about. And I knew like about reconciliation because. Uh, I spent eight years in the boarding school. I was, when I was a child, um, my father my father would uh, sing every morning, and he'd sing this song, and I remembered it. And uh, 
That was the beauty of uh, growing up in, in my home. Till that one day that a yellow panel with a police car came to my house. And uh, as we would always do, we'd always uh, hide behind the house when somebody would pull up because nobody ever came to the house with a vehicle. We didn't have a vehicle. And then my mother called us and said that we had to go with these people. And I remember like uh, my brother, my brothers and I and my sisters, we were crying because we didn't want to go and we had no, no idea where we were going. And I remember as clear as day when they opened the, uh, the panel door, there was no windows on that panel door, just on the back. There was two little kids and they looked terrified sitting in there. I remember getting in there and then we were taken what seemed like a long ways. Later on in my life, I found out that it was only like about 15 miles from the reserve because I went to a boarding school called Blue Quills, which was one of the last residential schools that was closed in the 90s. And I was, um, I was thinking about this as I was going. And I was uh, wondering like, uh, is this just one of those things where um, the government uh, puts money into something and a whole bunch of people make a lot of money out of it and it doesn't really do anything? Sort of like Indian Affairs, because you, you give like a, a uh, uh, billion dollar budget to Indian Affairs, but actually People from Canadian society say, why do all those, those Indians get all this money? Those First Nations people, what do they do with it? What they don't realize is that, let's uh, take a billion dollars is given to, to uh, First Nations people, um, supposedly. Um, most of it never gets to the reserve. It's all tied up in the bureaucracy. At least 800 or 900 million. I was wondering if the same thing was going to happen. Like is this, this because I didn't, I didn't really understand uh, the concept behind this ballet. And then I went and I met some of the people and I met this one guy. And uh, in uh, in the uh, Munyao culture, that would be uh, the white man, uh, they, they, they talk about this aura, and it's this brightness that you see amongst all of us here. In our language, we call it uh, the atak. It's the spirit. It's the glow. And when you come into a presence with a person, you can tell without even touching them you have this perception about them. And I met this guy, and I could tell that he had like a, 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 genuine, a genuine feeling behind him that he was real. And uh, when I got to know him more, I was right. Uh, and uh, when he asked me to sing a song, I sang him the morning song. And of course he he really enjoyed that, and it became part of, uh, part of that ballet. And what the morning song is telling you is about the awakening, your spirit awakening every day as that sun comes up. Like this morning, I never forget what I'm taught. And I told, I told uh, Jeff about this. Like, uh, I, I got up this morning at about six o'clock, well before that, and I went outside and I did like smudge and pray. The sun's coming up. I had a guy come up to me, by the way, and ask me, hey, what's going on? And I said, I'm trying to burn down the hotel. And he said, ah. And I said, no, I'm just, you know, the holy water, uh, same thing. And he said, okay. Um, but I do that every morning. I was taught that a long, long time ago. When they were doing this, this going home start, and there's a lot of pros and cons to anything that 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 is developed 
There's always the, the positive and negative. And, and when I was in boarding school, I learned to dwell on the negatives. But as I grew, I, I grew, now I know about positives. And I, I try to look at the positives. I try to pull out the positives. And I was, I was, I was thinking about this as this project was going. I was wondering, like, how many First Nations people are going to watch this? How many First Nations people watch ballet? Well, in my community, probably no one. And I was thinking about it. And then, well, who watches ballet? And I thought, well, affluent people. The, the people that, uh, that, that have money. And uh, so who, who runs politics in the country? Well, the affluent people, the people that have money, because that's how society, Western, Western society is set up. If you have money, then you're going to make decisions. I thought about it and I thought, how many of these people know the real stories behind residential school or First Nations people? And I used to always think that everyone knew these stories. But I learned that many, many Canadians do not know the stories because people living right in the next town to me don't even know about the people on our reserve and what happens. They, all they know is about innuendos, the things that are taught to them in education or in their home. So they don't really know about us. A lot of those teachings are fallacies, by the way. Um, and I thought like, uh, maybe with something like this, we can have an awakening for those people. And maybe they'll start to understand. Maybe they'll try to, try to learn more about us. I, uh, I hope that they do anyway. And then uh, maybe the decisions or the way that, that uh, they speak with us or, or the way that uh, we do business together or, or make this land great together will be even better. That's what I thought. That's why I thought like bringing my group to be a part of this would do something good for First Nations people. You know, I, I can still hear all of those little boys in that dormitory every night. And uh, I like that music. I can't eh? shut it off. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I decided it would be something positive, not just for our group, but it, it had nothing to do with um, how much we, we would make or anything like that. It had a lot to do with what kind of educational impact it would have on the people that were watching it, the people that make decisions for the country. That's what I thought. And I, 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 think, I think that it did because we're sitting here talking about this after the fact. So I think it, 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 it's good. And of course, there's going to be some negatives towards, uh, from it, as, as you've heard from my colleagues. And, and many of them are, are uh, they're right in their statements. But I try not to look at too many of the negatives. I, I try to look at the positives and I, going forward, because I think like, if we look at the positives going forward, the next time you do something like this, you're going to look at all of those negative aspects and then we're going to do them right. So we, we, we try to look at the positives that, that this, this uh, production brought about. Um, and, I, and I'm going to say, like I heard, I heard some people say that it's not, some of it was not, not, not true. And, and, and having like a, a, a man rape a child on the stage, well, that just wasn't, a, you want to know something? That really happened. That really happened in those schools. That was reality. 
And I think, I think like, you know, some of the, the storyline, running away, I seen the storyline about running away from the school. I did that. I did that with my brother. I, I still feel the electric fence. When I touched that fence, as we were crossing a field, I touched the fence, boom. It was an electric fence. And I was going to tell my brother, too late, he touched it, too. Anyway, but I, I, I did all that. So I, I, I know those things. I was reminded of a line this morning that I, I said on there. Uh, and Jeff, what was that line? Jeff, what was that line? If it wasn't for us, they would not have survived. You know what? What I hear from our elders back home is someday we'll have to help everybody again. And that's, that tells me about the resilience of our people. I, I, I work with, the, uh, with a lady who came one day and she was talking about Trump down in the States and she says, you know, I told my husband that if he ever pushes that button, I want to be over there on the reserve with those people. And, and, and uh, she, uh, she, her husband said, why? And she said, because they're resilient. If anybody's going to survive, they will. After everything that's been done to them over the last 500 years, they will survive, and I believe that. I'm gonna, we are a resilient people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in because uh, uh, I've heard a very specific uh, going towards the future part. It kind of ended with the apocalypse, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> which is <laughs> not what I'm. You know not, what? Saying that the uh, the production <laughs> it, it it was positive. <laughs> It was, a good, it, it was a good thing to put out there. From my own perspective, uh, it, it was something good. And you know what? I might just watch another ballet again. It was actually a pretty good story. Yeah. Well, well, and, and, and thank you to Christos for giving me that opportunity. Otherwise, I would have never... What a great transition to, to, to go to, because I was just about to say that I can tell we're about to start talking about next steps, but I'd really like to hear from Christos about uh, his experience in this production and how it came together and some of his talking points. Because I can't see you, Christos, so. I, yeah, I, 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 after all the things that Steve said, I forgot all my talking points, so I'm gonna improvise a little bit. Um, I, I, I must say, just commenting to, to what, uh, what everybody said earlier, I am just completely, almost purposefully unfamiliar with institutional thinking. I, I am part of an institution, I teach at the University of Toronto, but my, my approach to life and to my work and to my art is always one person at a time. And that's the way I treat my teaching at the university. I don't believe in grand ideas or structures, or I, I just want to find, to, to be able to make some real contribution to real people, whoever they may be, whoever crossed my path. And, and my, uh, my art is always somehow, uh, unless I do this and unless my art is about human rights, I just cannot seem to be able to function. I just, I, I will create something fake and I don't want to create something fake. So. I was not an, an initiator of this project. I was approached by Mark Gordon, uh, the choreographer, uh, after he had listened to a lot of music and he decided that he wanted me to write this project. Uh, Mark was a total stranger to me. I didn't know anything about him uh, beforehand. I knew about the role of Ballet, but we had never had a relationship before. So um, when he told me what the project was, uh, I said to him, well, you're going to have to come and we have to get together and, and spend a weekend and just kind of listen to a lot of music. Because they said, there is no way, you know, a classical ballet works for the symphony orchestra. I said, we can just not do this piece with just an orchestra and, and ballet dancers. We need, we need native singers, so which he, all, he had also agreed. So he came over, we started listening for uh, for three days, uh, YouTube uh, CDs that he brought together, um, 
and the two the two voices that for me were important not only because they were just hunting and stunning but because because of they also managed to transcend cultural specifics in other words to be able to speak to people who were not necessarily familiar with the company with the cultural context from which these artists emerged where where Tanya Tadak and the Northern Cree singers so we we decided that th those would be our collaborators and of course then there was a lot of approach and discussion um the other thing I requested early on is that I don't want to start in the composition of this project unless we all get together which means Tanya Steve and uh Mark and I um in Winnipeg, we go into a studio and we just kind of share stories, listen to each other, trying to understand. I mean, we couldn't really explain what this ballet was going to be about because at that time we did not have a script from both Joseph Boyd. We all knew the general, just the general subject. But that to me was, again, you know, having a script in front of me would have meant very little unless I actually could actually establish it a personal deep relationship with the people that we're, we're going to make music together and as i said music is really the thing that i was doing i cannot speak about the dance i cannot speak about the script i never spoke with joseph boyd at any time before the premiere you know mark did that um i i must say that when i first the we got to winnipeg uh, I, i'm sorry if this may be just personal stories that may not actually paint a larger picture. When I when I, we first went to Winnipeg in the studio, Tanya, who is a world traveler and, and, a, and a, she, she works with all sorts of different artists outside of her own community, just went into the studio and just started, started improvising and giving us some really powerful stuff. And Steve was very reluctant because he just needed to know what this is about. And, and a, a part of our impulse at the beginning is that neither Mark or I could actually help him very much what it was about because we didn't know and um, this was a this was a strange and, and uh, uncharted territory for us and you know and and, and so was Paul you know what but, but, but Steve and his group did. we were just simply blown away but beyond that we, we didn't know really much about it and I remember very very well because we had three days that the studio was good and by day, the, pretty much the end of day two, we had hardly anything from Steve. And that became a concern. Uh, and, and at the same time, the more he kind of was reluctant to give us his own music, you know, the more I kind of begin to understand that this is not going to happen unless we, we really become friends first. And our friends had really started with a breakfast on day three when we had a really pretty serious argument about gun control. And we never really agreed about this, about <laughs> we still maintain our separate positions about, about this issue. But, but the interesting thing after this was that because we just got animated and because there was no hypocrisy anymore, but, it, but we just laid it on the table of how we felt about it. And, you know, the next thing I knew is we just drove straight into the studio from there and Steve walked right into the important booth and start, started offering us these stunning song, songs, you know. And if there's one thing, one positive thing I can say about Boy and Homestar, because I, there's none of the negative things that you have said that I would not agree with. I can actually tell you that, that I, I was so much had such anxiety with, with, with this project as, as I was working on it that at one point I thought I was actually having a heart attack and, and I was taken into the hospital and it was not of course you know it was it was an anxiety attack and and you know and that that just kind of describes a little bit my my predicament for eight months in this project which was under a pressure cooker with hardly any sleep one thing that just came out of it is when one day I I sent some samples of what I was doing to Steve, which, which were involved in the music. And I just said, Steve, I, I just need to know what, where I am with this, you know, and not on some sort of, not on some sort of aesthetic or cultural level, but 
listen to this and tell me, do you hear it? Do you understand it? Does it is it something in this that you can actually relate to? And the only answer that I got back was, I think the only thing that Steve said was like, and by the way, my Cree name is, and then he gave me the screen name. And I, I was just puzzled on the other end because I was a great trepidation. And at this point, I don't know. And I had to ask Tina Keeper, and I said, what does that mean, Tina? And he said that your friends and brothers. You know, and, and I, that friendship alone for me is just all that to me going home star is about. If everything else is taken away and this remains, I'm the richer for it. Uh, another thing I want to say, which is a little bit more, uh, when we're talking about the going home, going home star, I must say, for, for those of you who don't know the Northern Cree singers well, is that they have been nominated for a Grammy Award seven times so far, including this year. They have performed multiple, multiple times on the Grammy stage, including this year. They have never been nominated for a Juno Award, ever. And this year, they have been nominated for a Juno Award and won in the most secular of all categories, which is classical classical music of the year, classical recording of the year. And to me, in some ways, if, if you want to talk about what Going Home started, this is quite a justice. You know, and, and I'm so proud. Uh, I was nominated in the same category in the, in, in the same classical uh, category that I lost. And I also think that is quite a justice. You know, and I am so incredibly proud of him and, you know, of the fact that what they do in their own culture is in fact classical music. And the fact that they've been, you know, they've been nominated in a classical music category, which normally was interpreted as settler culture always until this moment in time when a pop war group was nominated for that category and won that for me just seals i, I would just go back and just do it exactly the same again. thank you thank you for that christos um i can see everybody has different uh like they're everyone is looking at taking the mic all at once i can see it in christine's eyes um uh, I think it's also really a good point to start switching gears towards like moving forward and if you want to jump on you want to grab that mic just do it I can see it's like well there's uh, and there was some things that I seen on stage and I don't know if I said this earlier but there was uh, imitations of uh, dancers doing cocaine uh, which I thought was really inappropriate and as a choreographer I I shocked that someone would actually create that movement and be okay with that. Because to me, that's not okay. <laughs> it's not okay to, uh, to, to say what, yeah, the rape scene really, it was really inappropriate. And also that uh, a lot of our men suffered from sexual abuse and they still do in our communities. And that's something that we have just started to touch on, uh, alcohol, is another one um, that's, uh, so these are real stereotypes that are feeding an audience. Uh, to me, uh, something I positive <laughs> to share is that in an, in, it's so much about intention and an approach to a work that in, when I approach a work as a choreographer, no one person is better than another that each one of us has a gift to offer, and that goes from the music, to the dancers, to the person who sweeps the stage, to, or the studio, that each one of us has, is as equally important as another, and that's breaking down that hierarchy um, system. And in the work I do too, almost even with larger productions, every day, it, because it becomes so powerful and it becomes an entity of its, of its own when you're doing the correct steps. And when I'm working every single day, I have to ask for guidance and help to be guided to do the correct things because there's so much uh, 
forces that interplay with that, with real art and real life. So, um, so this is, yes, there's a lot of great um, pieces and with the music, but it's still, um, it's not okay, it's not. And for someone who struggles to try to get art out there about my own family story and can't get a penny, and asking Canada Council, why did you let this happen? They said, it's not our problem. You have to call the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. Looking at the board, me, saying, how am I going to talk to these people? So, so I'm so thankful to be here, to be able to share and express uh, who, where I'm coming from. And uh, because things have to change, but we have to, it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be scary. Real things happen when we're scared, I, I feel. Um, Lee, I'll, I'll quickly throw something in there. Um, so I got to do this because it follows hers. Can I do it? OK. Uh, I want to I wanna follow Christine. I think um, you said that you wanted to do a Canadian play this morning. And so here's a story that happened to me. It was 1989. I just done I Am Woman. And I went to do a reading at the University of Calgary. Anne Green, who was uh, doing the Writers' Festival then and whose award I won, was putting it on. I was the first Indigenous person invited to the Calgary International Writers' Festival. These seven women came there. They were Ukrainian women. And they were in their 90s. And they said they came to Canada with the first wave of Ukrainian people, 1905. And they were taken during spring thaw through the mud to northern Alberta and dumped off in a, uh, this block of land and told to grow wheat. And I don't know if you know, but uh, wheat requires a, a long growing season. And of course, they had to hybridize it. So that first winter, they were starting to starve. And the bunch of little girls from across the lake, across Lac La Biche Lake. Little native girls came to uh, give them berries and pemmican and whatnot, dried uh, fish. And then the next spring they said they'd come back and showed them how to catch it and pick and survive the next winter. So that happened, they came back and they went berry picking, they put up food, they snared rabbits, all this sort of stuff. And then in September, they disappeared. And they, in the summertime, the two of them came back instead of six of them. And the girl said, where's the other girls? And they said, shh, we don't talk about the, them. Okay. So then the next year, the same thing happened. They went, same summer, they went berry picking. Then when the girls in September left, they didn't come back. And finally, after three years, they had no friends. And they stopped asking and they got busy with their lives and they forgot about those girls. But then this woman says, phones them up, who she had moved to Lethbridge and she said, there's an Indian girl who's partly Métis from this area, from our area, and she's doing a reading at Lethbridge or sorry, in Calgary, maybe she knows what happened to those girls. And I did know. They asked me what happened to those girls and it was Bryce who left a record of it. I said they died in residential school. It was in the heyday of the dying of children in residential school. That's part of the truth in this reconciliation process that is not on record because the government won't release those records, the numbers that died. That's the Canadian story. That's the story that we should have heard. So, uh, I think that actually fits into what I was going to say even more so, which is, um, um, so Going Home Star opened uh, a conversation in general, 
but it didn't uh, really address sort of uh, public representation and on whose terms representation is taking place. Uh, as an example, you know, like right now, if you see a representation of that play uh, on the side of the National Arts Center, um, people would see what looks like a, a schoolgirl outfit on a Chinese dancer, and that somehow represents uh, indigenous identity and the hardships of indigenous people. Uh, it's, it's kind of fitting when you say that, um, that uh, it, it kind of shows how Canada would rather um, have someone portray that than actually tell uh, like a, a core story or like get into the truth. Um, and that door has been opened. The next steps to me are sort of about uh, establishing that representation and establishing those terms on how that's uh, done. Ex well, exactly. Jeff, maybe you want to jump in? So, you know, the, the, the content and everything, I, I think what we've heard, if we listen and if we hear properly, is very valuable. But I think there's also things we need to learn in terms of an institution. And, for example, the story of Ecstasy of Rita Joe that became a ballet, 1971, it was a ballet. In 2015, we did Going Home Star. Between 1971 and 2015, how many Aboriginal dancers are there, dancers are there in the Royal Winnipeg Ballet? How many Indigenous choreographers are represented in these institutions? And what, what are we doing if we're, if we're going to put our nose into these issues in one way or another? What are we going to do as institutions to make these things last and, or to make these things have an impact or have a value? And I found it very strange when we first talked about this and we looked around our own organization. And what do we represent? Uh, to be blunt, uh, we're sitting in a city in a province which is 13 to 20 percent indigenous. Um, all the dancers, except for one, come from somewhere else. One Winnipegger, and she's not Indigenous. So what have we done as these institutions? Uh, what was just said, uh, you know, about the lady on, uh, on the picture at National Arts Centre, that represents Indigenous art? That's strange. That's really strange. A white European elitist art form with an Asian lady portraying an Indigenous person represents Indigenous art. So what is our responsibility as institutions in terms of what we're going to do, what we're going to partake of, what we're going to make possible, what we're going to open ourselves to? And I think we really have to think of this. This was part of my education, part of our education, uh, when we actually did this show. Will something come of it? I don't know. The other thing I thought about is what's in it for us? And I can think of a lot of things that's in it for us, but what is us? So we helped share a bit of a story with a predominantly non-Indigenous population. Okay, but is that good enough? And we have to think about what, that is, what, it, what it means. There are amazing, amazing artists out there. Uh, in terms of dance, I look at what uh, Sante Smith is doing in Toronto, what uh, Sandra Laurent's company is doing. And a very, very important question is why? what's the content, what's behind what we do, what you brought up. And I think as institutions, right, we become institutionalized and we do things because we can, maybe not because we should, maybe not because we want to, or maybe not because we understand it. And I think as institutions, and we all represent institutions here, we really have to kind of get back to a basis of what art is about. Is it about repeating, pardon me, the right note at the right time? Or is it actually having a meaning behind that note and understanding what that meaning is? So I think these are things that have kind of been brought to my attention today. Okay. I'd also just give a couple practical um, following up on that and it just um, triggered with me with the National Arts Centre and the hiring of the first Indigenous artistic producer um, it's been a really lengthy process. They've done a year-long um, hiring process and a really interesting, fulsome, I think I would say Indigenous process. So uh, with candidates, they actually went into communities to meet 
and family and friends were asked to speak. So it's sort of a really interesting Maori model. But um, my question, so I was part of one of those circles for one of the candidates and I asked um, what their board representation was at the NA still, NAC and they still don't have an indigenous board member. And yet they're launching an indigenous, you know, an entire indigenous. That's worse than that. So when I asked that, you know, right away, the resistance from the National Arts Center was, we're planning on it, but it's really hard, you know, also, and it, it's bureaucracy. And I said, I work in bureaucracy. And those processes can be sped up and it can be addressed. It's up to you to speed that up. And here's a novel idea. If we're getting moving away from tokenism, how about not just one indigenous board member also? <laughs> um, and it was really, it was a really hard push at my work at the Ontario Arts Council when I started to bring up the idea of what about not just one indigenous person on a, pa a non-indigenous panel? Especially if we're speaking about Northern Arts where 50% of the communities in Thunder, in Thunder Bay, for example, is indigenous. And that was met with a fair bit of resistance because we're starting to look at power now, right? And shifting makes structural shifts of power and readjusting that. But it was okay to have, you know, you know, four Caucasian people up until that, and one person that holds the weight of that whole panel representing the diversity of Indigenous people. But then questions and resistance really, you know, it was a lot of work about, okay, now then if we don't do that, how can we at least give tools to protect that one juror? You know, we will, we will read the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights in certain sections. So there's a lot of practical things. Um, I'll, that would I'll, take a couple days. I'll throw in um, some additional facts that are uh, pan-national, which are uh, right now within all of the ministers' offices, that includes uh, Indigenous Affairs and Canadian Heritage, uh, there are eight Indigenous staff members uh, working on Parliament Hill total. Uh, one is a security guard. Um, there, there's one in the Indigenous Affairs Office, congratulations, and there's one in the Canadian Heritage Office, congratulations. Both of those individuals have the weight of representing all Indigenous people in that office. These are the, the offices that decide to do massive Indigenous projects. How much can the consultation even be, you know, when you're faced with that? So, um, you know, when looking at, uh, I don't know, I'm not even supposed to be talking, I'm supposed to be moderating, right? But when looking at the bigger picture, I know I never just moderate. <laughs> but looking at the bigger picture, there's so many things in play, and as institutions, these are the constraints that you're all navigating. So like, these are the things you deal with. And I also wanna acknowledge the solitary person clapping when an equity, equity conversation came up. Thank you very much. <laughs> One of the calls to action is financial equality. I don't know if you know this, but for every dollar the feds give you, we get two bits. Everybody's always saying, oh, the government gives us all this money. No, it doesn't. It takes. Billions of dollars a year come out of our territories and very little goes back. It gets washed out here. You don't see it because the government doesn't say, oh, Canada gave uh, white people a check. They don't say it that way. They say the feds are negotiating with the province on how much they're going to subsidize the TTC or the LRT or the hospitals or education or whatever the case is. So the financial equality is the big one on the calls to action. If the Winnipeg Ballet is going to get subsidized, whatever they get subsidized, then something should be going to Miss Friday and Ann Matogsi for the dance programs of uh, Penny Cucci and, and uh, Christine. I'm sorry, Christine. <laughs> I think that's simple. Stop thinking, Canada, that you can speak for us. Steve, you look like you got something to say. Uh, I have a comment. Uh, hey, 
How many Canadians here? Raise your hand if you're a Canadian. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, second question. How many treaty people here? How many treaty people here? How many treaty people? Okay. I'm from BC. There it is. Uh, do you know, uh, actually, uh, the First Nations aren't the only treaty people in Canada? Every other Canadian is a treaty person, too. They're the other half of the treaty. And, uh, well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying, like, you know, it, 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 it's valid. And it, it's, it's got something to do with what she's saying about, about the dollars. Because if we look at this, back when, when uh, people first came to this land, my understanding is that there were treaties signed. And, and, and that there was to be a division or, or shared wealth. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you're speaking to, mm -hmm. is that everything should be shared. There's billions of dollars that are, are extracted in resources yeah. from this land. Why is it that exactly what you're saying, it's, it's, it's that we only get a pittance? And then it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's put out on television and in newspapers. It's like, uh, it's like broadcast. It's like almost like a target for everyone else to talk about. And uh, I think like if we, if we, if we, if we had, if the, if the Canadian government had actually followed what they had set out, we would be in a much better place, e even with the arts. Um, what, uh, I, I just want to say what Christos was saying about uh, the music, that's what I was there for too. Um, not, ne the awards and that, the recognition is, 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 is okay, but that's not why, why I do this. It's something that I grew up with. Uh, it's something that I'm passionate about. I do it because I, 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 I I want to inspire young, young people, young First Nations people to believe, to believe in, in their, their artistic endeavors and that they, they don't have to emulate anyone else. They can be themselves and they can aspire to great things. That's, that's, the, only, that's the only reason why that, that I do this. Today, my, my son, I'm very proud of him. I'm very proud of him. He's going, he's, he's, taking our, uh, he's taking a drum and he's going to a, a small celebration. It's not about money. It's not about awards. It's something that we are. That's who we are. Uh, and, 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 and that's art for us. That's, that's our art. It originated with us. Um, so I, I'm just, uh, I'm conscious of, uh, of time. Uh, so I, I want to make sure the audience has uh, time for questions. Uh, I also wanted to, um, to to underline that you know uh, we're here to give answers. Um, you know, like uh, this conversation could literally go on for another five hours, like or ten days. Like it's there's we're just scraping the surface of so many issues. I'm also conscious that uh, uh, Christos has only spoken once, so um, you know, feel free. Like he is like using the intra web to talk from very far. So please, somebody get up and ask a question at this time. Now. <laughs> I know you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Simon Winnet. <laughs> <laughs> and I work for the tenement. <laughs> I'm bringing this one down there. Or no, I'm not. No, that works. Okay, we're almost good. Yeah. Don't put them together. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, my name is Simon Wenet, and I work for the Thunder Basin Symphony Orchestra. Um, I'm still fairly new to this community. I've been there for a year and a half. Um, and often, and I'm a Korean, but adopted. Um, so I've got this perspective that is very unique when it comes to my community because I'm a foreigner that grew up in Quebec. I can just be 
<laughs> are you are you sure you don't want me to bring this mic down there or <laughs> or you could come right up here if you like yeah okay like yeah okay good um, so I feel like I have this um, very unique perspective on my community because I'm a foreigner I grew up in Quebec now I'm this in this um, anglophone community with a very small francophone community and we do have uh, First Nations that live in our community which is their community <laughs> and um, we really try to um, reach out to them but I also think that we do it because we have to do it to please our funders because it's well received with our grants and budget. Um, may we become allies for you uh, to be able to um, not speak on your behalf, but advocate on our behalf. Um, and how can we make sure that we can make it happen? Uh, because right now, how I feel is that um, the way we reach out to First Nations community is probably not the best way. So what's the most respectful way to do it? And is it ours to go and meet with you guys? Or do we just wait for you to come to us? Because that's another question that I'm struggling with right now. Who would like to respond to that? I'm just going to say it again, sir. <laughs> yeah. I think you, you weren't hearing uh, what I was saying. So I want to say it again. If you don't want to do it, then just say not going to do that. What the 94 calls to action advocate is equality of funding. And that's what we want you to do is advocate for us with the funders, that there should be equality of funding. I don't know if you know, but Canada Council gave us leftovers 20 years ago. The number of artists increased 10 times and they increased the funding three times. So we now have less than 20 years ago. In the meantime, it's gone up for Canadians. And it started very big for Canadians. So equality of funding is what we need. That's what we need. Now, if you don't want to do it, I'm, I'm OK with that. Christine? Also, uh, but without leaving, because I was going to help share something that asking why you want to, why do you want to reach out to the people in the community? Like trying to figure out uh, what is, again, it's so much about intention. Like what is it that you're trying, uh, what is it you're trying to achieve by reaching out to the people? And a, a good way is to uh, find an artist whether, and not just one kind of artist, I think you could find a, a contemporary artist and more of a traditional based artist and look for uh, like someone in your area, I would suggest Don Kavanaugh. So looking for someone who's rooted in the area and who's also an artist to help uh, create that, um, that, uh, that dialogue. And cause he'll know what the, and going, to find you going to the communities, going to gatherings that are happening. So you have to really, I think you have to make a big effort to put yourself out there. I, I would like to add also just to even back up from um, your question of how do we reach out to them? Um, and right away, because we have this language, I've worked in institutions where you hear that, then you feel already about it's been set up as the other. So it would be really awesome to work with someone like Dawn, find out someone who's a reputable person and just start by educating you and, your, um, and the organization about the history, the indigenous history, about indigenous rights, about the original peoples of that area. And once you're armed with that um, information, then you can start reaching out to make relationships in a more meaningful way because you're armed with the knowledge to work, move forward in a more sensitive way with a really good understanding of the history in that area. So that would be my recommendation. Funders aren't going to, funders like at the OAC, if, I'm, if it's still, if I'm correct, it's 
um, trying to equalize so that indigenous priority, it's, it's not saying go out and indigenize the symphony, it's actually just trying to equalize historical inequity. So if you are an indigenous organization, then you will be brought up to, and we're trying to fill our same way, but they're trying to fill a gap. So I wouldn't use that as your motivational so point, but it's an amazing question. It that is. That needs to be addressed on bigger forums. I, I'm glad that question came up as well because um, it, it's this it's this idea that um, outreach to indigenous communities uh, automatically is like special and has some kind of um, additional consideration and it, you know it does but it's also like um, uh, like if you're doing a symphony and your mandate is to cover this region and an indigenous population lives in that region then they're your mandated group to be serving so it's not really like how do I reach out to them how do I reach out to the people I'm set out to be representing and to be including in this? So it's not an other group, it's actually part of the group that you're set to be serving. Um, then there's the conversation, and I deal with, I've dealt with this recently with uh, Folk Music Ontario where uh, they were looking for how to have uh, indigenous audiences increased. And they were saying that all these different folk festivals are programming Buffy St. Marie or different, you know, uh, indigenous acts and yet there's no indigenous audience and I'm like did you tell any indigenous people that the show was happening and they said well we advertise it in the in the paper and I'm like maybe they don't read the paper like w where are indigenous populations you need you know like just the same as a, a francophone and an anglophone community may have different publications and not be reading the other ones if you're wanting to reach a group you promote to the group so you know like if uh, I said very specifically, go to the band office and spend money on promoting your event and you know, make sure that your promotions are talking about how you are welcome and safe space, that you're interested in having this conversation, like open the door, you know, because it's all you can do. And then you'll, they'll educate, they'll either educate you by telling you to go educate yourself, which you should do ahead of time, or you already have and maybe, the, maybe it turns into friendship, who knows. Oh, Catherine. This is a question for <clears throat> everyone on the panel, uh, both present and uh, virtually with us. I'm Catherine Carlton, Executive Director of Orchestras Canada. Uh, and well, I'll make a statement first of deep gratitude to all of you for speaking from your hearts uh, and for being here today. Uh, your generosity is extraordinary. I'd like to ask a question to each of you, and Clayton, I'm going to ask you to organize which order this goes in so that we don't all get excited at once. Um, you are each important artists, and I'd love to know what you are each working on right now uh, in your artistic practice. Um, would you be willing to share with us what you are working on right now? so we can learn more about the things that you are passionate about and not simply the panel topic. So maybe I could frame that even by saying, we're gonna try to keep it very brief. <coughs> if we have to go through the whole group, um, like maybe five, five minutes max type thing. And I'd like to also contextualize it by saying, uh, how did these different experiences, whether going home star or related to these issues direct what you're working on now. And I, if, if Christos is interested in going first, I'd love to hear from him. Uh, yeah, I would be happy to, to say my, uh, since going home star, I have done a, a number of projects, but the one that has actually is very much representative of, of my current interests, which is, uh, it's a project called Symphonia in parentheses migration patterns and has to do with uh, climate change, uh, population displacement, uh, and uh, migration. And, uh, and the focus of this project was two specific areas where climate change has, has been affecting the most, and one is the Fertile Crescent, and the other is the Arctic. So I, um, I have again engaged with uh, with indigenous, in, 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 in indigenous singer, uh, 
Tiffany Aydalik, who is a singer from uh, Yellowknife, is the first throat singer that I have actually met who can actually read music, like notated music, so she can engage in an interesting conversation with, with the orchestra. The, uh, I don't consider that to be a specifically or exclusively indigenous uh, uh, issue, you know, so because climate change affects the entire humanity. So I feel a little bit much, much more comfortable in the mix than I felt with Going Home Star. And, uh, and this project uh, had an original premiere in Winnipeg last, uh, last January, and we're working on this now on, uh, uh, on developing it further with 3D animation. So the project basically has two singers, one a Sufi singer from Canadian who, who was educated in Syria, uh, learned Sufi music. The other one is Tiffany, uh, in a throat singer. The symphony orchestra, surround sound, stereo, 3D animation and virtual reality. And now we're developing the 3D animation and virtual reality components. So this is, this is a project that interests me because of its urgent message, the human rights aspect, and the fact that I don't feel as like fish out of water in terms of engaging with it. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really, uh, I really appreciate that honest, uh, those honest comments about uh, about that, and I think it's very strong to uh, be defining uh, indigenous inclusion in projects. Uh, do not make projects suddenly indigenous projects. Um, uh, does somebody want to? Uh, somebody want to jump? <laughs> Lee, do you, I can see you holding your breath. <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> I'm a fiercely productive writer. I just finished an essay for a Canadian reconciliation project. Um, I did two sh short stories in the last week. I'm rewriting um, the Mink story. They want it. In the, my publisher wants it in the third person instead of first. And I'm working on a collection of. Uh, Essays called Conversations with Canadians, and I'm also working on a rewrite of a collection of collaborative poetry that I did almost three years ago now with a couple of other women. We're going to work some more on it this summer called Hope Matters, and in between I uh, continue to write poetry. Awesome. That was so fast. You totally caught me off guard. Uh, do you want to just maybe go down the path? Like, Jeff, do you want to talk? I'm a very unproductive writer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since I left the Royal Winnipeg, I've been pursuing some independent production work. Uh, a, a friend of mine uh, has wanted to develop a, a show of his for a few years, so I've been raising money, or uh, let me put it this way, I've been trying to raise money for uh, this production. Um, the idea it networks with Banff and uh, a, a consortium of uh, artists across Canada. Uh, I've been, I have been doing some writing. I have a lot of middles, no beginnings, no ends, but um, maybe I can figure that one out. I lack discipline. Um, just okay, so it's, it'll stay esoteric then. <laughs> and um, uh, the. Uh, there was a project Christos is working on that I'm trying to push a little bit further. Uh, and I'm working with a company that does some virtual reality activity. Um, and uh, with um, Tom Jackson's project, uh, we might be doing this in episodic virtual reality online with the idea that eventually it becomes a, a live show. So just playing around with different kinds of technologies and uh, that kind of stuff. And ultimately, I'd also like to produce a presenting dance series uh, in Winnipeg and beyond. There's a bit of a hole in the middle of Canada uh, where other companies and other artists don't show up. And I'm going to try and do that. And then at the end of that, I'll be bankrupt. <laughs> oh, and that's just me. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm, uh, I'm working. Uh, I've just gone through a creation phase of a new work. It's entitled Maggie and Me, and uh, it's a healing dance. And I'll be at Canada, our Canada Dance Festival, um, but not the main. Next year, I'll be presented there. So, uh, so this piece is about um, 
about connecting the spirit realm, the present realm, and the dream realm, and that our uh, gifts as uh, Anishinaabe people are, are there for us as they were thousands and thousands of years ago, that, um, that we can tap into those gifts. So it's connecting um, and showing uh, those realms as well. Uh, I, at the end, there's an improv section, so I break the walls of the audience to connect with who is present to be able to uplift and um, that's the healing aspect of that. Uh, so my director is uh, a, a mentor of mine, Robert DeRosier, so I had the honor to work with him. Uh, so I'm also um, working on um, a piece with uh, Jennifer Podemski. Uh, I just choreographed the Indie Spire Award Show this year, which was in Ottawa. And this was the marriage of uh, music, contemporary uh, dance and music. And uh, it, it's about nation to nation and recognizing the individual cultural um, significance that we all carry in our communities and that we're not just one big pot of um, uh, made, yeah, <laughs> we're actually, we're as unique as the land of, that represents Canada. Like we, because we're our people, we're a representation of, of the landscape. Um, where I'm from is, uh, it's, it's part of the Canadian shield and it's islands and water. And if you were to drain the water out, it's, it's like we're living on mountaintops. So that's, um, and we're medicine people. <laughs> and my, so what else am I doing? I started to launch a company for myself called Puckwis Performance. And Puckwis is um, a Manitou, a spirit who was the disowned one. <laughs> and uh, that's me. And, uh, but also the entertainer. Uh, so I, after, I was very inspired by this piece to give something very positive about going home that I have to get myself out there, even as a mother with seven 15 and 17 year old. Uh, I'm 43 years old, uh, but I'm still dancing. I, there's no age that says that you can't do this anymore. As long as I'm healthy and I keep making good choices, then I'm going to dance. I don't feel fulfilled in my career. Uh, I'm, this summer I'll be doing a 10th annual dance camp in my community. And um, so I'm... Uh, flying by the seat of my pants, I <laughs> know, but I'm, I'm trying to establish myself as a company and uh, so I can, you know, so we can see that there's, you know, there's other contemporary Indigenous dance artists out there, so, um, and then what else, I think, uh, well, there's more, but that's good for now. <laughs> I guess uh, my life is my art right now. I just went through a year and a half of cancer treatment, so it's always nice to be included when you're in an isolated place. But it's been um, actually a very transformative year and a half because through the process, I've really connected with my indigenous um, side. And I've, I really through discovered that our gift as Anishinaabe Nishan Bay people is really is, is as healers. Yes. So um, as a nation, we're renowned for that. But um, that it was really had to go underground, but there are still carriers. So um, going through the trauma of the Western Euro system, I knew in order to survive, I had to reach out to, to um, you know, the first elder that I saw in my process and he, I sat down and he said what took you so long <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, and I really had to look at myself and say I've been this advocate in this public place um, okay <laughs> it's been very much akin to a creative process um, <laughs> yes um, 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 yes, yeah, so when, um, when we, uh, w there are so many, th I realize that we have a lot of mnemonic tools that we use that are just reminders. So even when we do something like for institutions, an acknowledgement of land or 
when we give tobacco, you might not mean, you know, you might not know, people might not know what they're doing it, but eventually, if you do it enough, you might ask. Um, and that uh, life can be a creative process and that ceremonies teach us how to, um, there's also a process when you've gone through transformation of reintegration. Um, so I, I feel, um, I don't feel grateful, but I feel extremely lucky. And sometimes when I wonder about, when we talk about decolonization, I feel really grateful that when we do that and I was able to indigenize myself, that there were people waiting there for me. Um, I don't know what it would be like to not have that. So I'm really grateful um, for that. And um, eventually, I hope to just start, you know, writing this down and developing programs through my experience around this concept of culturally, cultural safety, because I think it gives a really good framework. Um, and that's all I'll say. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I don't have uh, much uh, going on. Uh, my group, Northern Cree, will start uh, their tour next week in uh, Winnipeg at the uh, um, Indigenous Music Awards. And uh, uh, we recently had an offer uh, to go overseas uh, to Australia for four weeks over the summer period. Uh, however, uh, like I, say, uh, I was saying, uh, we always stay true to ourselves and uh, we're, we're, we're traditional uh, powwow or cer ceremonial singers, so uh, when our people call on us, we, we uh, attend to them first. So we have many bookings across uh, uh, North America every weekend after, uh, after Winnipeg, uh, our, our, our own summer celebrations, uh, powwows if you will, uh, where my group is uh, hosting various celebrations. In between that time, will be uh, at various festivals. I was uh, uh, just mentioning that uh, we'll be in Toronto on the 14th for a festival and uh, a, a number of other places. So we'll be quite busy, uh, probably the busiest we've ever been. Uh, that, uh, that Grammy spinoff was dynamic uh, for my group, uh, which was a good thing. Uh, I'm, uh, I've been working on a uh, memoirs for about the last 15 years. And it's uh, basically, uh, it's not my, my memoirs, it's, it's my group's memoirs and our, 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 our travels. And uh, I, I, uh, I had worked with a friend of mine, uh, David Bouchard, on a couple of uh, children's books. And he was the guy that said, you should publish this, because I, I had him read a bit and I said, uh, I, I can't do that right now. Uh, I think uh, it would be better after I, I stopped traveling and, uh, you know, I, I just stayed closer to home because, like, uh, I, I put things in there, like, uh, I always say, like, uh, the truth uh, sometimes can, uh, 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 can be kind of harsh, uh, just like uh, what we're talking about here. And uh, in those memoirs, there's some, some things that are brought to light about uh, powwow groups and uh, they're not as uh, as uh, spiritually or holier than thou as, uh, as presented. So uh, I'll probably release that after I, I, uh, I stop traveling. And right now uh, my biggest project is with my students uh, in my school. We have a, yeah. we have a, a dance theater that we've, we've developed uh, with uh, all seven uh, Native American dances and um, all, all of the uh, the big drum, the small drum, uh, Native American flute, and it's a 35 minute, minute uh, presentation that uh, we choreographed uh, specifically for other schools. As I mentioned, going out there and educating them, uh, and doing our part. Uh, so that's what that's what we're doing. That's that's probably my biggest project, and I'm 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 very excited about that for my students. Uh, aside from that, uh, my group has a new album coming out. Uh, it's uh, it's called Mugekse uh, Pa, which is good morning, and it says make a stand, and it's uh, based on uh, based on our our our, our, uh, our people starting to stand up. That wasn't the song. And speak up. I don't. That wasn't yeah. one of your demos. I no, no, no. Uh, starting to speak up, and and all people in general, uh, being aware of uh, 
Mother Earth and, uh, and all she gives to us and, and just making a stand for her and, and the things that are really important um, in our lives. Uh, so that's coming out pretty soon. That's uh, basically what I'm doing right now. Uh, thank you for, for listening to me and uh, thank you for having me here today. Catherine, I, I appreciate it. I hate Mr. So, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about my arts practice, but I will talk about what I'm doing just because I don't, I don't want to get into it too much, but, uh, but, um, I want to acknowledge, uh, the weight of these, uh, cultural roles and, uh, and the weight of advocating for rights and, uh, the toll it takes on people and how um, every time I uh, take a podium, um, I acknowledge the fact that I'm speaking with just my voice. Uh, I often acknowledge the people who have asked me to speak on their behalf, um, or the people that have uh, tasked me to represent them. And uh, it's really important to, to realize that you carry a lot of weight when you're put in those positions. And um, uh, I, I heard uh, the reference to nation-to-nation uh, -nation context and, and to education, and it makes me think about uh, my path right now has been to uh, task the federal government to put a uh, legal definition to what when they refer to Indigenous art and what that means, because uh, currently they use that term very loosely and it has no uh, implication. Uh, we also have a government that says nation to nation publicly and there's no, if you, if someone goes and Googles nation to nation right now, there's no definition that gives them a quick answer of what our prime minister is talking about. Which means that uh, when people hear that language, they have to go looking for answers. They're not readily available. So uh, when you talk about education, there's so much work to be done, like so much. And, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm so, on behalf of uh, the, the panel, I thank you all for listening to us. And uh, I also will say that, uh, you know, anyone that has questions or, or is like, I I'm, I'm feel like I'm starting on some paths and I'm looking for direction, uh, I don't mind taking on a little bit extra weight. If Catherine uh, wants to give out my email and you email me, I will, yeah, I'll take that. I'll be like, that way, go. You know, because I'm not going to do things for you, but if somebody feels the need to get that push or to have some direction given, I'll forward something to someone. I'll respond with a quick link to something. Because I can tell that there's people that feel like uh, nothing has been done and they don't have that starting point. That's not everyone in the room, but if that's where you're at and you need that push to get started, I will push you. <laughs> I will. Anyway, I'd like to give a round of applause to uh, both the audience. I'd like to thank Christos for on the monitor. I'd like to thank the panelists for here. And I'd like to thank this uh, space for, acknowledge for uh, accommodating us. So thank you very much. <laughs>